All right, so we spent a lot of time last week talking about the Carolina Panthers' third-round pick, Matt Corral, and whether he should start week one, whether he's the future, should it take more time, slow development, all that kind of stuff. We talked ad nauseum about Matt Corral. Let's go ahead and talk to somebody who watched Matt Corral throughout his entire career down there in Oxford, Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi, better known as Ole Miss. Michael Borky from Super Talk Mississippi, Sports Talk Mississippi, joins Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council. Talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday through Friday, your team every day. That's what we do here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Nowhere can you hear Carolina Panthers coverage Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and Friday, except for right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Make sure to watch the show and subscribe to the show over on YouTube. And if you don't watch the show or subscribe to the show on YouTube, shame on you, but that's okay. We have other, we have other options. We are a podcast, so we're on every single podcast platform. Whether that be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Stitcher, you can find the show and all the shows across the Locked On Podcast Network on those locations. I ask you to rate, review, and subscribe. Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions. So either at me at Julian Council, DM me at Julian Council, and leave a comment on today's show, Tuesday show, Wednesday show, or Thursday show leading up to Friday for the weekly Friday mailbag here on Locked On Panthers. As I hinted before starting the show, Michael Borky. He is a host over there at Super Talk Mississippi, and he's a co-host of the show Sports Talk Mississippi, covering all sports going on there in the state of Mississippi, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and whatever else is going on in the sports world there in Mississippi. He is an Ole Miss alum, which means he sat there and watched and covered the entire career of new Carolina Panthers quarterback, third round pick Matt Corral. So I think we're well past time. I wanted to do this last week. I got sick, so I didn't have the opportunity to sit down and talk to some people I wanted to talk to. Hopefully this week will be jam packed with guests who can talk about the Panthers draft and also talk about uh, Matt Corral and what his impact potentially could be here in Carolina. So we'll start off this week by talking to Michael Borky of Super Talk Mississippi Sports Talk Mississippi right here on Locked on Panthers in just a moment. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NBA playoffs, Stanley Cup playoffs, and Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting, the playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, back here on Locked on Panthers, and as promised, Michael Borky of Sports Talk Mississippi is part of the Super Top Mississippi stations all across the state of Mississippi, Magnolia State. And by the way, guys, today's episode of Locked on Panthers is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Michael, how you doing, man? Oh, doing really well. Just uh, enjoying the Mother's Day. I don't know if you can see. I got my dog sleeping back there, so yeah, it uh, it could be worse right now for sure. Yeah, man. Well, happy uh, Mother's Day to everyone out there. I know you, your wife and you. You guys have a child, so happy Mother's yes, Day sir. to your wife. Yeah, two and a half year old uh, ball of crazy. So I can only imagine. I am not anywhere close to wanting to be in that stage of my life. So kudos to you, man, for getting it done. But uh patience is the thing that I have developed the most. I had none of it. And uh that is it, I have a, a buddy that just had a kid and he was like, Well, what would you say? You know, give me your, your best advice. Learn how to be patient. Yeah. That that's the key <laughs> here is nothing is gonna go the way you planned it. Just be patient. So I'm getting there, I think. Yeah, well, patience is key, and I think that's actually a great word. It's been kind of the word the last few weeks here in Carolina as the owner, David Tepper, was talking about patience leading up to the draft, and now with Matt Corral here, a third-round pick, the Panthers trading up to get him, there's been some talk of patience as folks are chomping at the bit to see this guy play and hoping that he might be the franchise quarterback here in Carolina, and that's in part why I have you on. And It's not only that you – cover sports down there in the state of Mississippi. It's also that you are an Ole Miss alum. So you yeah. sat there and watched his, his whole career. And two, I see the state of South Carolina flag. You are from Greenville, South Carolina. But you're right. you're, you're a Saints fan, though, aren't you? 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I have the worst <laughs> how did you become a fan story ever. So I grew up, I didn't have an NFL team or, or anything like that. I, I go to Ole Miss, and in the four years there, uh, we would go to New Orleans once or twice a year, uh, whatever the case may be. And yeah. I, I was such an idiot. I Like, we would stay at a hotel near Bourbon Street and just go from the hotel to Bourbon Street. And I, 19-year-old me, thought this is the greatest city on earth. Like, whoa. I could not get better than this. And now I avoid that section of it like the plague. But of course. Uh, after college, I, I got the job here doing radio here. And I had an apartment that I could barely afford that came with the cheap cable package. And the only NFL or NBA I could watch was the local Fox broadcast of the Saints and the Pelicans. So I just kind of decided, yeah, forget it. I'm just going to be a Saints fan. And I'm going to be a Pelicans fan. And now I'm eight years in. And I right. completely bought into both, but like, I, I have no, like my dad took me to a game when I was a kid and it was awesome. It's like, no, I couldn't afford a cable package. So I could only watch the saints. So I just decided I'm going to be a saints fan. That is my, how I became a fan story. It's a very bad one. Yeah. Well, that's kind of just interesting. Cause like knowing the Panthers like history in the upstate, like starting off playing at Clemson at Memorial yeah. stadium, having training camp every year outside of the pandemic here in 2020 at Wofford in Spartanburg. Like, were you never attracted to becoming a Panthers fan? You're going to think this is stupid, too. So I grew up going to Furman games. My dad and I, that's what we would do. Okay, And go so Dan. since they did training camp at Wofford, I didn't like them. Okay, because Because they're Furman's rival. You know, I'm 12, I'm like, yeah, forget those guys. They're Wofford's or Furman's rival, and I hate Wofford, even though I had no idea about anything. But it, there's no animosity. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I my sister actually uh, lived next to Robert Lester, okay, right? yeah. uh, who played at Alabama. Was practice squad guy for for the the Panthers for a while. Played some. Uh, so I've always had not an affinity, but I, I have no ill will towards the Panthers. Let's put it that way. Well, I, I like to hear that. I mean, we yeah. we both can share the hatred of the Falcons. Now, yeah, so like that's it's, where it's easy to do. We can share in that. But uh, let's get the Matt Corral, man. Like, so I've always been more of a college football guy than the NFL guy. Um, and I remember tracking his career, at least his recruitment. Like, he was originally just going to Florida. And they have all the coaching chains to go there. He ends up at Ole Miss. When he got down to Oxford, like, what was the expectation of for Matt Corral's career when he first got down there to Ole Miss? It's it, His college journey is is a pretty remarkable one. So, uh, as you said, committed to, to Florida. Dan Mullen gets the job. Dan Mullen doesn't want him anymore. Uh, USC and the colleges out there didn't want him because of the fight with Gretzky's kid when he was 16. And so he gets to Ole Miss to play for Phil Longo, who, as you know, is at uh, Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, Matt Luke, in, uh, I guess they were either moving on or he was getting another job, whichever story you want to believe. But Phil Longo leaves and Matt Luke hires – Rich Rodriguez. So Matt Corral, we get a, our introduction to him in 2018. And then in 2019, he is in this dated uh, 2005 offense with Rich Rodriguez. And he ends yeah. up losing his starting job to John Rice Plumley, who couldn't throw worth anything. He's at US, uh, UCF now. But playing he can baseball. Run, playing baseball. And, yeah. and apparently he's going to start at quarterback this year. But he was in an offense that didn't fit him at all. Matt Luke gets fired. If Lane Kiffin was not Ole Miss's hire, Matt Corral was going to transfer out, likely with Oregon being the destination. But Lane Kiffin comes in, is able to essentially re-recruit his quarterback, and then he goes from uh, th this guy that has the fan base divided to, um, you know, he was on a fight or in a fight in the Egg Bowl, sort of. You know how on-field yeah. fights are. They're never really fights, but he yeah. was in a scuffle on the field, had, had the fan base divided of who should start, who should not. Lane Kiffin steps in and unlocks what you always knew was there, which was incredible raw ability. He just wasn't being used appropriately. Kiffin comes in, unleashes that, and then he exploded on the scene and became uh, what he is today. It's his journey, not just football, off the field, it, it's pretty unique. He is yeah. not your typical stere your stereotypical quarterback at all. And on the field, off the field, everything in between. It took a while for him to become what he is now. Yeah, let's talk about that. We can get back to the football aspect of it. But that was one of the things that came up on draft night. Ian Rappaport, I didn't necessarily love the way he reported about Matt Corral and his issues. You bring up the fight that he had with Wayne Gretzky's son back in California, which led him to change schools. 
originally from Ventura, California, a home of Patagonia, the folks out there who, yeah. who know. Um, and then he ends up, of course, at Ole Miss. But, you know, he's had issues with alcohol, which, I mean, hell, anyone who's been in college has had issues where they with alcohol. And he's also had issues with depression, which I applaud him for being open about that. And, and I applaud our society also to finally recognizing like that is something yeah. that's serious and mental illness and mental health is something we should all take seriously and recognize is not necessarily a weakness at all, but as a strength. Can you kind of just give us a background on kind of the stuff that Mac Rouse went through and his development, his maturity since he stepped on campus there in Oxford to now here as he'll step foot in Charlotte as a rookie here in Carolina. Yeah. And first and foremost, if fans are, are expecting your stereotypical quarterback, I'll use Drew Brees as an example. You're not getting yeah. Drew Brees. He is, he's different. He's edgy. Um, he, he's not buttoned up political, almost like your stereotypical NFL quarterback is. Um, he's very raw and very real. Um, he will, uh, he, he has anyway used bad words, if you will, in interviews. I mean, he's he's yeah. a lot more real and raw and different than your stereotypical quarterback. He's not going to you know, get a white picket fence in Myers Park, and he's not going to be married with four kids in three years and, and just be like your local politician. He's, he's different. He's edgy. And, and I think that, honestly, is to his benefit because he plays like that as well. But it, it took him a while to go from uh, the, the leader – or excuse me, uh, he was kind of a punk – I mean, that's just the truth. When he got to Ole Miss, he was kind of a punk and at times had a bad attitude and had some off the field issues, a fight on the field, stuff like that. And he blossomed into a leader, but it took a while. There were, I'll give you an example. So yeah. before the 2020 season, if you remember, I, I'm sure you do because everybody does. It wasn't just COVID. It was uh, after George Floyd was murdered and, and everything that happened after that campuses all over the country were having protests and things like that. This state was very unique at the time, especially on that campus. There was a, a fight in the legislature here to get the state flag changed. And there was a fight on campus, a successful one in both of these cases to yeah. get a statue moved. And so you've got the, the nationwide conversation and then a hyper localized conversation in a unique place with a unique background in those kind of things going on. And apparently there was a team meeting. If I understand the story correctly, there was a team meeting like most teams had talking about experiences as young African-American men in this country with what's going on right now. Yeah. And Otis Reese, uh, a safety for Ole Miss said in this meeting, you know what, Matt, you're the quarterback. What do you think? You tell us what you think. You're supposed to be our leader. Lead. And whatever Matt Corral said in that moment was when he won the team over. Whatever he said in that moment was, okay, this is our guy now. And then you saw that shift in his play as well. Even from that 2020 season where he played really well with the exception of two games where he turned it over six times. I think six times in both games. I know it was six interceptions and five interceptions against Arkansas and LSU, but yeah. he fumbled on the final drive against LSU his play grew with the person that he became. He went from a punk, like I said, which is what he was, to by the time the 2021 season came, he was the culture setter. He was the, we're going to have 5 a.m. workouts before we go to class. Or they started having morning practices as well under Lane Kiffin. So he yeah. would come in at 5 a.m. They'd work out, then practice. And, and that was him setting all of that. Uh, a punk from culture setter a guy that was sitting on his couch as he said out loud crying for no reason to a guy that was the centerpiece of the first 10 win football team in the history of his school. It's a, a remarkable journey, but it took a long time for him to get there, which is why you've seen a lot of this stuff about him. And it's all real. It's all true. Yeah. He did have off the field issues. He did have on the field issues. He did have turnover problems. He had maturity problems. All of those things that were said about him are real. What you should hope as a Panthers fan is what you saw at the end of his Ole Miss career continues on that path. Because if he does, that's a guy that you can trust to lead an NFL franchise. Matt Corral 2019, no shot. The guy that just played for Ole Miss with two sprained ankles, that, that's that's the guy that I think if he continues on this path can lead a franchise. See, and what you described there, 
about Matt Corral is just the essence of the college experience. I mean, you get there, you're a kid, punk, immature, don't know anything. And you go through life in college and having to learn and make mistakes and how to be an adult. And at the end of it, you should grow up being better and being an adult and ready for the real world. And that's really what, from what I listen to you, that's what you're describing, what Matt Corral did there at Ole Miss the last couple of years and getting to the starting job and developing to the player that he is today and the man he is today and being drafted by Carolina. So, I mean, all of that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about the off camp, off the fields kind of stuff. Like that's, that's just part of being a young man and being and growing up, becoming an adult. But let's take a quick pause here, Michael. And then other side, let's talk more about the football aspect of what Matt makes Matt Corral, Matt Corral. We'll do that here in a moment. I'm locked on Panthers. Summer is coming, and with summer, you're going to need some food on the go. Built Bars are the perfect snack to take with you on family vacations. Throw them in your bags and in your kids' backpacks. Make sure that everyone has a bar so that you are fueled for your summer vacations. The best part about Built Bars, they're healthy and delicious. No more sacrificing delicious food for health. With Built Bar, you can have both, and it's easy. All you have to do is go to Built.com and order now. All Built Bars and Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate. That means that with every Built Bar, you can eat healthy and enjoy eating them too. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to your average candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Built Bar is by far the tastiest and healthiest choice of the two. Go to Built.com right now and use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, back here with Michael Borky. Follow him on Twitter at Michael Borky. He's one of the hosts of Super Sports Talk Mississippi on Super Talk Mississippi. Heard all across the Magnolia State. We're talking about the Ole Miss alum and the Carolina Panthers. Hopeful future franchise quarterback, Matt Corral. And Michael, I go back to Labor Day night of 2021. Ole Miss down in Atlanta playing against Louisville. Len Kiffin has COVID, doesn't coach there on the field, but that did not deter or hinder Ole Miss's offense, in particular Matt Corral, who in 2020, as we discussed, was a guy who had turnover issues, in particular the Arkansas and LSU games, as you brought up, to a guy who looked like he had full command of the offense with Jeff Levy, the former OC now at Oklahoma there, helping to call the plays and be on the sideline. Like at the end of the game, I remember him talking like, hey, coach, we miss you. We need you. But like they got it done. Like right there, I think you I could tell, all right, this might be this might be a different kind of season for Matt Corral. This guy might actually be it for 2021. How did mm-hmm. you feel when you looked going back to that moment? And that whole game too was another step in his progression. So there's there's things that you love about him that you simultaneously can't stand about him. So yeah. It, you know, like yeah, what people tell you not to do in job interviews. Oh, what's your what's your biggest weakness? Oh, I care too much. That is something that that Matt Rule needs to try to rein in. He's an uber competitor to the point where it can be dangerous, where he uh, he'll take hits that he doesn't need to. He'll try to run guys over that he shouldn't, especially with his frame, those kind of things. But what happened in 2021 versus 2020, and you saw it on that night in particular, was patience. Yeah. He, he was much more patient as a quarterback in 2021 versus 20. And he didn't let one mistake, although he didn't make any that night, uh, unravel. He was more willing to take checkdowns and, and stuff like that. And, and you saw it that night where uh, there was one throw that it was kind of risky and he completed it anyway. But that was when you, you thought there wasn't a single, oh, crap, why kind of play from him where you saw a bunch of those the year prior. And then that really manifested all season long. I think he had four interceptions in 2021. But that night, it looked like a different guy than the year before, and his coach wasn't even on the sideline. Yeah, uh, just patience and comfortability uh, was was apparent. And what's disappointing, I guess, is one way to describe it is you didn't get to see him at full strength all year long. I actually uh, I have a friend that is a Panthers fan uh, that grew up in, in Greenville with me that asked me about Corral and said, "Well, I watched him. You know, towards the end of the year, he wasn't very good. It's banged up." Panther Panthers fans need to understand if you watched him late last year, you were watching a Matt Corral that was not even anywhere close to 100%. And I know it's football and you know guys are hurt all the time. Not necessarily the case for him. So in the Tennessee game, 
He ran for 200 yards, had 30 yeah. carries, and it wasn't a product of, of Lane's play calling as much as Tennessee, for whatever reason, uh, when they would read pass, would just clear out. I mean, they, they would just leave the, op- the middle of the field wide open, and so he would pull the ball down and run because they were just giving that to him all night. Sprained his ankle that night. The next week at Auburn, sprained the other one. So he's on two bum ankles, and through the course of the rest of the season, he wasn't even practicing. They, they, he couldn't. He physically couldn't practice. He had people telling him that he should hang it up for the year because the NFL's coming. You know, you shouldn't play. Wasn't practicing. He said even when he was playing, which, by the way, with the help of a little cortisone shots, was the only reason he was on the field anyway, he yeah. couldn't step into throws because he would step onto his, his drive foot and it would hurt so bad he couldn't step into his throws anymore. So he was a shell of himself at the end of last season because he was so banged up, he probably shouldn't have been playing, but he did not. He, If you told that kid you're not playing, it would have been a problem. I mean, it, it would have been like full-on Tom Brady, I'm going to have a meltdown against you, coach. I'm playing in this game. You can't tell me what to do kind of stuff. He's that much of a competitor. But that guy that you saw at the end of last season is not the best version of him, not even close. Uh, he was at two bum ankles, cortisone shots, not practicing at the end of last year. So that yeah. wasn't him. You know, and the thing about that too, like, I guess like L- the LSU game, the game where they retired Eli's like number that, I mean, that game, he was spectacular and the Louisville game like we talked about, but I've been telling the listeners here on the show, like the game that most impressed me last year was that Tennessee game. I mean, I got back late night, watched that. I mean, in Knoxville is just absolutely insane. And knowing yeah. the history that Lane has there at Tennessee, and I, no one was really surprised by the events, especially if you know Tennessee fans. And if there's any t- Tennessee fans listening, please don't come after me. Um, but still, like the way he played, just like showing that that man's an absolute warrior yeah. to go through that game on that bum ankle, to have to carry the ball as many times as he did. Then the Auburn game the next week. I know he threw a late interception. It, two, I, I, I made a mistake two weeks ago, or two weeks after was the Auburn yeah. game. LSU's yeah. in between, but what? either way. And it's worth noting that night in Knoxville, too, his three best receivers uh, were all out. So he was throwing yeah. to a walk-on and a couple of guys that um, have either been encouraged to transfer or chose to transfer. I mean, yeah. they, they, they were it, it, that team itself was a shell of itself at that point. So – not only did he play well, he played well with his three best guys. And there was a steep drop-off between his, the top three receivers on that team and number four, for example, yeah. uh, and did it without those guys as well. I mean, it's injuries killed that team, but playing through it the way he did, considering the personnel, and then one of – I talked to a guy that was there. He said it was one of the most violent environments. He's been doing college football, television, radio, whatever, for two decades in the SEC and said that was the most violent environment he's ever heard in his life. So wow. you've got, you've got that pressure. <laughs> you, you can't, I forget at what point in the game he hurt himself, but gets hurt in the game. His three best receivers are out and he still somehow willed them to a win. That is Matt Corral, right? Yeah, there. no, I mean, right there is when he won me over for good. Like I was already in love after watching the first month and a half of the season, but there, and then finally, after they win the Egg Bowl, just his, his, the interview he has to talk about how much it meant to him. for, And it's just still incredible to me that Ole Miss has never had a 10-win regular season until never. that bat. And even, like, I'm thinking about a couple of years ago, Hugh Freeze, who I know I'm sure you'd want, like, like love to hear that name. But even with Hugh Freeze, I was like, damn, like, they were cheating that much. And they, and they went to a Sugar Bowl and a Peach Bowl, and they didn't win 10 wins, 10 games in a regular so, season. Either. No. Uh, the, the Sugar Bowl <laughs> year, the, the Sugar Bowl was their 10th win. Yeah. But they lost to Memphis that year. That's right. That's <laughs> right. They Memphis did. Memphis that year. Paxton Lynch. I was just saying, and then what um, Kim Dietschy, like got like a concussion in that game. And people were like, we're freaking out about that. Yeah. It's Hugh like, Freeze decided to play him at running back. And yeah. that was the end result. So, yeah. Well, not surprising. Yeah. But um, moving on, though, but like that, just listening to that, him, him, like him in a perspective that he had there. And then honestly, playing in the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. And one of the things, like, I've always, like, you're a college football fan. I'm a college football fan. Like, I recognize that these guys have to make business decisions and that these bowl games and the amount that there are, it's not necessarily as important as they used to be. And absolutely, do whatever is right for you. If you don't want to play, don't play. But I don't, until Kenny Pickett, I don't recall any potential first round quarterback ever sitting out a bowl game. 
And looking at the history of Ole Miss, it's not like you play in a sugar bowl right. very often. So for him to understand what it means to the program, and not just that, he said, I'm going to play in this because I wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for these guys. Like pick it, yeah. buy, whatever, do what you want to do, man. But I just thought like Pitt, the history that they have, more pro football Hall of Famers than any program. They've won NAS championships. And to not even play in the only big bowl game they played in like the last 40 years. I, I didn't love it, but I, I understand it. Didn't love it, but still, that with Matt Corral playing that game, I get he got hurt. I don't think that really played any factor in whether where he got drafted. He was probably going to draft third round regardless. Maybe he would have got higher. I don't know. I don't think it was that big of a deal. I gained a, immense respect for him while also recognizing if you don't want to play, it's fine. I totally get it. But like that night, I was just kind of like, okay, like this dude, his reasoning, like I'm here because of these guys and I'm going to continue to play because these guys got me here. Like, I love that about him. And, and that showed yeah. me so much about what his leadership is. And that's real. It, that That's not like some, res that, that's him. Uh, th those words, that action, that was, that's real. I mean, he, I can't tell you the number of people that were advising him not to play in that game. We're telling him, hey, it wouldn't affect you. The Pittsburgh guy's doing it too. Yeah. You're banged up. He, he went into that game, not a hundred percent. That's the thing. He didn't injure himself in the Sugar Bowl. He re-aggravated an existing injury and in, for whatever it's worth the night before that game in their final team meeting he's standing up in front of the team giving such a passionate speech about how this is our last time together everything changes after tomorrow he, he's drawn to tears I, I mean and some people call that immaturity I call that in, I mean incredible leadership considering yeah he th that's real and and that's him and that's what he will be for the Panthers now like I said before Rule's going to have to find a way to channel that a little bit because he does play every play as if the game is dependent on this one, which sounds like a good quality, but when it's week five of a 17-week season and you're the team's most important asset, you don't need to be trying to take on a linebacker in the open field. You know, just yeah. slide a little bit. But that's him. And I would rather have a guy that I have to coach that out of than a guy that I have to coach up to that intensity level. He was told not to play in that game by a lot of people. Hey, coaching staff, hey, understand, just let us know. We'll play without you, but it's fine. Agents, people around him, don't play in that game. It was not even a thought. Didn't even think about it. Yeah. It was, that's the kind of guy he became at Ole Miss. That's the, that's the leader. The I, I used culture setter before. Yeah. That's a perfect example of what he became. He was a culture setter. And the program's going to miss him a lot because of that. But that's what Carolina is gaining. As long as he can adapt to the NFL game and knowing that it's not 19-year-olds with girlfriends, it's 30-year-olds with three kids and a wife that you're talking yeah. to. But the the relation that – he relates to these guys better than most. And I know locker rooms are filled with guys from diverse backgrounds and stuff like that, but – I like I said before, his his edginess, his his raw, I think that relates to teammates better than if he were like buttoned up kind of guy. I, I think his his demeanor, his attitude, what he's been through makes him more relatable than mm -hmm. your typical guy. Some people view it as a negative. I think his path is going to really help him and, and really help earn respect in the locker room. And that sugar bowl and everything around it showed you exactly why to me. Yeah, no, I, I hope so, man. Like, I, I love the guy, love everything he's done. You know, I have some people who are not necessarily happy with me because I've just been since he got here. Like, he's a third round pick. Now, Albert Breer put out a stat last week. Like, only at the last ten years, only two guys who've been drafted in the third round in the NFL have gone on to be starters. Runs one is Russell, Russell Wilson, and the other is Nick Foles. <laughs> Foles might be a Super Bowl MVP, but he has not had the career of Russell. Yeah. Russell's probably going to go to the Hall of Fame. So, just the expectations should be a little bit measured. And the Panthers have gone out and gotten ahead of it. And they've also said that based off his draft position, we don't have the pressure that we would have had had they taken him at sixth overall where people wouldn't want to see him play week one. Yeah. Now he has time to kind of grow, develop, and then if Darnold plays where he's played the last four years of his career, then we might see Matt Corral this upcoming season. If we don't see Matt Corral this upcoming season, for me personally, that's fine. I can wait till 2023 and let the guy play as long as he's gotten to sit back, learn the offense, that is, if they still have the same offense in 2023, which there's a very good case. They might have a different head coach and therefore a different offense. But you're looking at him coming to the league. Just We know the strengths, the, just getting the ball that quick. He's a great athlete, fantastic leader, can relate to his guys. 
the weaknesses though like is there any one weakness that concerns you as someone who sat there and watched him the last couple of seasons when he's as he's heading into the league yeah there's there's a few I, I think emotion sometimes uh yeah. you, you saw it in 2020 now in fairness to him he had the second worst defense in SEC football history yeah in, in <laughs> terms of yards per game in yeah. 2020 and so I, I i imagine it's a little bit easier to start pressing into mistakes when you realize you basically have to score on every possession but you even saw it in the sugar bowl for example it was a frustrating start to the game for him his offensive line got absolutely smoked i mean yeah. old Ole miss up front in that game were like billy madison with the second graders playing yeah. dodgeball i mean it, it was that bad um, and you could see it frustrating him a little bit. And then there was one play where, if I remember correctly, it was a called pass, but he decided to pull down and run and decided to physically take on the entire Baylor defense. Just he ran a guy over and was barreling through a couple more. And you could see that fans love that, but you could see that that was a product of frustration. And you can't do that in the NFL because even though his frame – when he measured at the combine was a good number for him. He didn't play at 212. Not even, yeah. he did not play at 212 at all. The frame can't, and how many quarterbacks could actually hold up on that beating anyway? Cam Newton's huge. He gets officiated differently, but he's huge. And his body at times has broken down because of the physical beating he's taken. So if Cam can't do it, Matt can't do it either. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes uh, you can see the emotions if he makes a mistake or whatever, um, will spill over and they will lead to a mistake. They'll lead to a, pre whether it's pressing or something like that. He does wear his emotions on the sleeve, which can be good, but it also has at times shown up on the field. So he's got to rein some of that in, rein some of that energy, you know, passion, whatever you want to call it. That's got to come down a little bit for him to be a 17 week every year NFL quarterback and consistency with the deep ball. Um, you like you said, quick release. It, yeah. it, his release is excess. He gets and he does the arm angle thing as well. He he'll throw sidearm. I saw one of the NFL analysts say that one of his weaknesses is that he only throws from one arm slot. That guy did not watch him play hey. once. Yeah. He didn't watch him play in college at all. Um, uh, so he he can manipulate his arm slot. He gets the ball out quick. Uh, can fit the ball into tight windows. Deep ball consistency uh, was a bit of an issue last year. Uh, he's got the arm strength to do it. It's just sometimes uh, just not as accurate as you would like him to be throwing the deep ball. Luckily, it's not an arm strength concern. It's more of a consistency concern, throwing the ball down the field. Yeah. And something that I've, I'm curious to see how it translates, Lane Kiffin, regardless of the the personality and the Joey Freshwater and, and the running around with a 26-year-old in Oxford, all that stuff, like all the things that come with Lane Kiffin, he's a brilliant offensive mind. And so often last year, Matt was throwing to guys that weren't covered. Uh, they, they were so able to exploit mismatches and defensive breakdowns and busted coverages that there were a lot of times where he wasn't having to throw guys open because they were so wide open that he oh, just yeah, had to get them the football. play sheet going in the air. <laughs> that kind of stuff happened with them all the time. Now, yeah. when he was asked to throw into tight windows, he could do it and has done it. There's just not a lot of that on his tape because that offense was so exploitative that it wasn't something that he had to do drive by drive by drive by drive because he was throwing to open guys so much. Uh, yeah. th that would be – so frame, uh, he's got to calm down a little bit. Um, the, the emotions are good, but sometimes they can be too much. And deep ball accuracy what would be the, the biggest things that I would watch for going into camp and uh, – preseason games and all that to see if that's uh, gotten any better. Okay. Well, last one here for you. I mean, obviously you want to see Matt Corral go on, have yeah. a great career, just your overall feelings. Like th what, what do you expect? Like, honestly think that uh, out of Matt Corral, what his career potentially could be like the pro, like best case scenario. And then I don't know. I, I just, I, how, how, like, what do you expect from Matt Corral's career? Panthers fans may not like this. The, the yeah. name that I, I keep coming up with is Derek Carr. I, I think that bad. I think that he can. And if you look at Derek Carr's numbers, like he's very good. I he's mean, fantastic last season, right? <laughs> I, I think uh, he he reminds me of Derek Carr. I, I think if if Matt Rule is able to uh, to unlock him the way Lane Kiffin did, 
Um, and, and those two guys became like friends. It wasn't a coach player relationship. It was like yeah. friend, friend relationship. They really cared about each other like that. If Matt rule can unlock some of that, um, if he can keep the weight on, uh, and control himself a little bit, I, I think he can have a Derek Carr kind of career and, and be a really good NFL quarterback for, for a long time. He's got to take care of his body though. I mean, you watch if a Panthers fan hasn't watched him play yet and you watch some of his games, he can't do what he does in the NFL. Sometimes he loves to punish people and you're not punishing NFL players the way no. you are two lanes, strong safety. It's just a totally different world. And I mean, I'll say this too, like Derek Carr comparison, like Carr just got an extension. He's now a $40 million per year quarterback. Like that's yeah. also the going rate for quarterbacks, but you also have to earn it. And if he can turn into that eventually, I think that's a good situation for the Carolina Panthers. Now the jury's still out on whether he can win a Super Bowl with Derek Carr. But Derek Carr also plays in the AFC West with Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, and now Russell Wilson in Denver. So it's not like it's that. It's not necessarily like it just happens. So right. I, I like Matt Corral. I, I love the breakdown, Michael, man. Like I was excited to kind of t- to talk to you about this because I, I know you as an Ole Miss guy down there covering this guy that you would have really good insight on Matt Corral and let the Panthers fans know what to hopefully expect out of him moving forward here in the future. You guys can follow him on Twitter at Michael Borky. Check him out on Sports Talk Mississippi 3 to 6. That's Central Standard Time, God's time zone, every weekday down there in the state of Mississippi. You can check it out online pretty much wherever you know you listen to shows and podcasts. I'm sure it's also available. Michael, appreciate your time, man. Of course, anytime. Absolutely, man. We'll take a quick pause and we'll close things up here on Locked on Panthers. Great conversation there with Michael Borky of Sports Talk Mississippi on Super Talk Mississippi, a native South Carolinian, but somehow found a way to not be a Panthers fan growing up there in the upstate of South Carolina because, well, he's a Furman Paladin fan, so can't root for anything that steps foot on Wofford College's campus. So I kind of get it. It's, uh, it's a little quirky, but... I like it in a way. So appreciate him coming on, even though he's a Saints fan. But he had a great breakdown there of Matt Corral. And hopefully to get more breakdowns the rest of the week on what people's opinions are on Matt Corral. Some of the folks that watch more of him in college. And hopefully Rowan Harper on the show. We can also try and talk to Davis Cheek later on this week. UDFA out of Elon as we approach rookie minicamp he- heading up here on the weekend. So in the meantime, it's going to wrap it up here for this edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Again, make sure to watch the show, subscribe to the show on YouTube. And if you don't watch or subscribe, it's okay. You can go over on any of the podcasting platforms that you use, listen to your favorite podcasts, including all the podcasts, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and this one on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and Stitcher. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And follow me on Twitter. At Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions. So either at me, DM me, or leave a comment on today's show, on Tuesday's show, Wednesday's show, or Thursday's show, and just say Friday mailbag and leave your name, and I will answer that question on Friday. In the meantime, stay safe, keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Tuesday.